Welcome everybody and before we start our service today we've got our next win it in a minute challenge. We've got three contestants today who were challenged by Joel at our last win it in a minute challenge and their challenge today is how many balloons can they blow up and tie in a minute and the winner at the end will get to challenge the next four people so watch out you might be one of those people who are challenged. So let's begin the countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, away you go. Well, you all did amazing there, great effort. I understand Jody sustained an injury during that, so I hope you filled, filled in an accident form. Well done to everyone. John, you managed three balloons. Isaac, you managed three balloons. But Jody, you managed four and a bit. Not sure you quite managed to tie that fifth one. So well done, Jody. Who are you gonna nominate for the next Win It In A Minute Challenge? Back to you. I nominate um, Ollie, Bertel, Jacob, Sivers, Sarah, Cattell, and Steve Town. Good morning, everybody. Good Welcome morning. to church. Welcome to Broadmead Community Church. We're really glad you've joined us this morning. Tell us uh, who's here on the live chat and where you're watching. Uh, from the, today. Um, we've got a great uh, service for you with loads of really good engaging content. I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's taken part and well done to Jodie on winning the Win It In A Minute Challenge. Uh, we've just got some updates uh, for you. Um, many of you will know that sadly Andrew Coleman's uh, father Dick passed away earlier this week and so we just want to lift them as a family, Andrew and Karen, Ian, uh, Andrew's brother, and his wife, Sarah, and lift them uh, as a family in prayer at this time. And also many of you may have heard that uh, Jane Wade, who's the minister at Abington Avenue URC, lost her husband, Mark, uh, this week to COVID-19. And uh, that's devastating. I think he had, was just about to retire, or was retiring from teaching, and uh, so we want to just uh, stand with them as a couple and stand with them as a fellowship at this time. Also to update you that Ingrid, uh, John and Jenny's mum is now home um, and uh, we continue to pray for her. And we also give thanks that Dylan, who many of you have been praying for, uh, is home from hospital again. But we want to continue to pray for his ongoing treatment and diagnosis. So we just want to update you on those things and pray into them. So I'm going to let Karen pray and lead us into the rest of our service this morning. So Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're the God of all things, that all our days are in your hands, God. And uh, uh, Father, we just thank you for the lives of uh, Mark Wade, Lord. We thank you uh, for the church family there and for what he meant to them. But God, uh, yeah, we feel sadness alongside them as a church family as they mourn the loss of him and uh, the impact that has on uh, the family as well so God we pray that you draw near to them and God uh, we pray uh, similarly Lord with Dick and uh, with the loss of him this week Lord Jesus uh, we we pray for Andrew and Karen Lord uh, they're loved dearly by us and God when one part of a family hurts all the family hurt and uh, we really sense that at this time so God I pray that you draw near to them as well 
as a couple and to the wider family. And Lord, we give thanks for the things that you have uh, granted. Lord, we thank you for Ingrid being able to come home and uh, to be with Keith. And we pray for the whole family there. Lord Jesus, would you strengthen them? Would you give them your peace? And would you surround them in your love at this time, Lord, we pray. And we give thanks for Dylan as well, returning home. And uh, Lord, thank you. He's a dearly loved child. And uh, we just pray, Lord, uh, particularly that you would continue to oversee him and that he would have uh, full restoration, Lord, to his health. Father, would you be with all the members of our church family, Lord? Uh, many carry things in their hearts, Lord, that perhaps haven't been spoken or shared. But God, I thank you that you care for all of our needs. And I pray that each person would know that this morning. Amen. Amen. So we are going to raise uh, our voices in worship this morning. And we're going to start. So jump to your feet, get your body moving and sing Hosanna to this action song. easy for everyone um, and uh, you know I, I have found for different reasons personal reasons and not just the lockdown um, many times uh, I have felt um, troubled uh, you know that I in a way I guess I try to make sense of the Holy Spirit of God of um, you know the father figure of God of um, you know I have so many questions that I can't understand and I think I have been feeling the Holy Spirit saying to me you don't need to understand everything and but what I do feel and is something that I, I, I take away from the scripture of today that is um, is that if I allow the Holy Spirit to guide me I think things are easier um, I may not have the answers but if I do trust and and I, I follow what I feel the Holy Spirit is saying to me, 
I know that things will be easier. Um, so I come to you today from a place of total submission. And um, and I believe that that's what God saying us, saying to us as a church to submit to Him, submit to His ways. And uh, and when in doubt, let's just try and listen carefully to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, but also to to follow, to follow what we believe and and to challenge what we feel the Holy Spirit is saying. Because I know that sometimes we may hear voices that are not of Him. So just challenging and go to back to the scripture, go back to the Bible to challenge anything that we may feel he's saying to us. Thank you.
We all have been shocked over the last few weeks following the tragic killing of George Floyd. We've caught up with a few of our church members to seek to learn together how we can respond at this time and what God might be saying to us through this situation. So I'm going to hand over to Owen and Cara, Claudette and Addie for their reflections on this really important subject of justice and equality. Over to them. The 
it's triggered by uh, upbringing, I guess, for most people. Well, for me, it is. I basically said the way I came to church was because um, living in Peterborough at the time we did in the 60s, it was very unusual to see a black face on the street. So um, our family was one of the first. Um, and, you know, my parents were very cautious about the fact that we were one of the first. Uh, so they wanted to make sure that we didn't rock the boat, in essence. We were yeah, my experience then... Um Slightly different, um, also with my mum and dad, but I came to the UK in 1962. So I'm a Windrush child. Um, sorry about the hands. I am a Windrush child, um, came to join my parents here. Um, so it was, a, it was a kind of a strange situation for me, but we did have issues that I, at one point, I was, I think, 12 and I was a prefect. And this young lady called me a gollywog. And that kind of upset me a bit. And I was very unprefectly and I hit her. <laughs> so um, I lost my prefect's badge, but also I was told I had a chip on my shoulder and that was how they dealt with it. That was it. And so I felt, well, actually I'm honored to lose my badge in actual fact, because she made me feel a way, but it was my fault. But I don't know. It's not been, well, race hasn't been a very prominent thing in my life, but there's obviously been like little experiences. Like I've been followed around shop before and there's been like little, like when you're in like primary school and they make like little comments and stuff, they're like, oh, you're brown. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and it's just, I don't know, little things happen and then you're like, oh, well, that's not supposed to be something that makes me different, but it is. But yeah. I think before like the whole Black Lives Matter movement was so prominent, it was kind of just like something that was in the back of my head, but now it's been brought forward and it's something that I feel like I want to actively be a part of because like I'm a person of color so it just seems like it should be something that I am like passionate about. My parents studied here from Nigeria. I was born here, but then I actually grew up in Nigeria. So it's, it, as I said, it's, it's almost it has to do with your experiences. And um, yes, I understand where a lot of people are coming from. A lot of um, the Black Lives Matter, it's important. But even though I'm black, my experiences are totally different. Yumi and I were coming back from London. We had just gone for, I think, a function or something. We were very well dressed and all that. And we were stopped um, by Seoul Central. And it was along the lines that, yeah, oh, we stopped you because you fit some descriptions and you're coming from a particular direction. And the next thing one of them did was actually going around, around our car, actually checking the tires. And I thought, I really felt small. Eventually they called through and I think they checked everything and it was okay and, and they just left. I mean, no apologies, nothing. Like I said, I mean, that, that day I really, really felt small. <laughs> you know? What are your reflections on kind of the last few weeks? It's definitely a heightened uh, an awareness. Um, and there's a whole range of emotions really because to see someone be killed on the street in broad daylight, no matter who it is, is wrong. And I think, you know, the momentum of this is, is a good opportunity to see something bigger happen, uh, a permanent change as well. Now, it's interesting that, you know, maybe they'll do some legislative changes, but it's not, I don't think that's the crux of it. I mean, I was listening to something today which really helped to get a perspective on it, which is, it's not about the legislation because people will follow the law, but they won't change their heart necessarily. So it's about a heart change. So there's like um, increasing globalization that my generation have experienced. So like we have social media so we can see like everything. Like I wouldn't have seen the George, anything about George Floyd if it wasn't for social media. And I think that social media has played a big part in it because like we are so in touch with everything that's going on in the world. So we have like, 
we have more uh, opportunity we have more opportunity to be like involved in it or like to see it and be outraged by it like i was outraged by the video of george floyd and that is what sparked my participation in the movement as christians we are taught that we should be as jesus did righting the wrongs doing the right thing standing up and being advocates for the people that can't speak um and i think you know um people can nominally class themselves as christian but they don't act upon that the comment was you know as a brother or sister you're supposed to love your brothers and sisters as you do and and to do that means that you empathize with their their difficulties and with their joys and if someone is um suffering for you know walking down the street as Addy was saying or that was saying and they're stopped in their car does that cause outrage for us or do we just think oh that's the norm mm. um and so it's about working out how much of a real love do we have for our brothers and sisters outside of the color spectrum but for the reality that we are all christians and we walk in the same walk we all have the same challenges we all bleed the same blood how do we move into that space where we actually are much more realistic about our love for each other you know if you you're addressing the you know you're addressing broadmead your brothers and sisters your your family what do you think they need to understand or or what would you want to communicate to them out out of this time no i i think um more than anything else is just we need to um think very very carefully as to what we want to um impart particularly um on our children people need to see you as you are for them to actually appreciate and know who exactly you are because there's so many stereotypes and till we break those um the walls of stereotyping i don't think we can actually move forward on this and um yeah so i think the key thing is yeah um go back to the biblical principles but more than anything else you try as much as possible to don't emphasize the color of the skin a human being is a human being end of story i think the only message that i can think of is that like you can't understand something fully without opening up to different perspectives so you can't just fully like say well this is my opinion on the black lives matter movement and that's the only opinion that is valid because everyone else is going to have different experiences and i've personally felt like my friends and people around me opening up about their experiences has helped me in this like movement to understand like what it's truly about mm-hmm. and i think that's just what everyone else should do because mm-hmm. it just helps a lot mm-hmm. i would say to our church family if you have a question ask it be bold ask a question if there's something you wonder about ask the question the worst anybody can say is i don't wish to talk about it but i think mm. communication is so important isn't there you know my manager at work said to me have i ever done anything and i said no you haven't but if you feel and know that something is wrong speak up don't just sit on it and go away speak up mm. you know for for justice for whatever and the black lives matters one i know that i've heard people say well all lives matter and yes that's true and i don't think by black lives matter they're saying well our lives matter more than anybody else's we're just saying that actually they do matter as well yeah. they are important so i think people easily go well our lives matter as well and we're not saying that but at the moment our lives black people's lives don't seem to be as important and i think that's what black lives matter is saying we want to come on par rather than always feeling we're the underdogs or we're not good enough um mm-hmm. so that was something i felt just to clarify i mean i love the way that broadmead is always challenging us to move to the next stage uh, in our walk with christ and it's just amazing that you know we have a progressive uh, uh movement towards a better christian discipleship which is great 
And I think, you know, the education aspect of it is good because we're taking biblical principles and we're moving us along with that. So I think part of that should be, you know, this education about how it is that Christ would deal with these things um, for, you know, he would stand for the people that were oppressed. He would stand for the people that were in the right, you know, uh, in the wrong place or the right, wrong, you know, people that are actually ostracized by society, the lepers that wouldn't be touched. He would stand for those. And he'd go in and he'd protect those, do the things that weren't expected to happen because he was demonstrating God's love. Um, and I think, you know, as a church, we just need to work into that, not just our church, but generally the church needs to work into that to start recognizing that we have a bigger picture we can play, uh, paint here. Um, because people need to get the perspective that, you know, what, what Christ says is important. The lives that he asks us to lead is important because he wants us to demonstrate the grace, the love, the joy, everything that comes with knowing him. So I think as, as a church, you know, my, my first thing would be to say that, okay, we take a stand as a church that we're going to follow the discipleship walk. We're going to do the things that we're supposed to do. And we're going to bleed with our brothers. We're going to stand with our brothers. We're going to support our brothers and sisters. We're going to do the things that we should be doing as equal, uh, as we've already talked about. I guess we look forward to me. I, I just love that picture in Revelations of every tongue, every nation, mm-hmm you know Mm -hmm. everyone you know together there's an opportunity to to restart and i hope that that hope and pray that that is what we see happening and that hearts as you mentioned earlier owen absolutely right yes there are established in law and etc that there are institutional changes but without a heart change that i don't think that makes much of a difference and i think that's a, a heart change Thank you to Owen and Cara and Claudette and Addy. It's really important that we keep this conversation going. And uh, for those that want to hear and learn more, which I hope are many, uh, the whole discussion will be on YouTube uh, in the next few days. So do take a look at that. Today, this is what I want us to consider. What do you tolerate to fit in with those around you? What do you have to do to fit in with the crowd? Let us pray. Father, today give us ears to hear what you're saying. May you open our minds to be renewed by your truth. May you give us hearts that are transformed by your love. May you stir our imagination to see the potential of your church and to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Well, welcome to our Dear Church series. And for those of you who are just joining us or maybe you've forgotten that we're in the middle of this series because it's been at least four Sundays since our last one, I'd love to get you all caught up to where we are. We're talking about the seven messages or the seven letters that were written to the church 
around Asia Minor, sometime around the year AD 90, most probably by the disciple John. Now, a lot of us have a real hard time with this book of Revelations, right? Come on, be honest, admit it. I mean, some of us have tried to dive in and we find ourselves surrounded by charts and timelines and interpretations that often seem to contradict and just leave us confused. And as of others of us find ourselves reading it and then we get to the trumpets and the bowls and the strange animals and we just flip right back to Ephesians where things make more sense. But here's what's interesting about this book. While we might find it at times confusing, the early church obviously was not confused by it. The fact that this book was kept around and included in this larger book that we call the Bible meant that it made perfect sense to the church in the first century. They understood it, they believed it, they knew what it meant, they knew how to apply it, and they found that its teaching was helpful and beneficial to the church. And so therefore they put it in the canon and they believed it was worth keeping around for application and teaching for the church for generations to come. They understood what it meant and so maybe instead of beginning with the question, what does it mean? We should start with the question, what did it mean? And when we start with that question, what did it mean? then we can move on to apply it to us today. And so that's what we're gonna do. And so we've had quite a bit of background stuff so far in the other sermons. So I'm just gonna take a few moments to remind us. The first thing I wanna talk about is geography and the second is culture. So geography, let's look at the map really quickly of the seven churches that these letters were written to. And one of the things you'll notice when you see a map of Asia Minor and those ancient seven churches, is that you find that they're kind of in a loop. And this probably constituted an ancient male circuit which formed the order of the churches in Revelation. The other thing you may notice is that many of these churches were situated at crossroads. Now in the ancient world, a crossroad didn't just mean you had to put a stop sign in place or a motel, spot the 1980s soap opera reference, Crossroads were very important places. They were places where culture and politics and society collided. They were hubs of commerce and communication and technology and ideas. If you wanted to get a message out across the ancient world, it would often get out at one of these crossroads. And the question that the church faces was, will they be faithful and will they be obedient at the crossroads? At the crossroads of culture, at the crossroads of politics, at the crossroads of life, and the crossroads of technology and ideas. And the second thing I want to focus on is culture. The cultural reality of these churches was that they faced tremendous external pressure from all that surrounded them and the incredible internal tension from having very different personalities and people involved in the life of the church. Now, the early church was composed of two different kinds of people. There were the Jewish people that had come out of the temple and the synagogues of Jerusalem and Judea. And then there were also these Gentiles who found the message of Jesus to be more compelling than the philosophies of the pagan world of Rome. And so they started following Jesus too. And they started showing up at the communion table and the gatherings of the church. And if you could just imagine for a moment that a Jewish zealot trying to overthrow the Roman Empire and a Roman centurion whose job it was to keep the peace. The two groups coming together around the communion table. See, would the way of Jesus be compelling enough to cause them to love one another? Would the message of Jesus be strong enough to cause them to look past their individual differences? Would their commitment to Jesus transcend other opinions, preferences and affiliations? See, that was the crucial question facing all seven of these churches. So let me talk a little bit about the city of Thyatira. It's actually the smallest of the seven cities. And even though it was a kind of small place, it had a road system that was considered to be a major road junction of the region. It had a famous temple to the sun god Apollo, 
and it was a huge commercial centre and there were two primary goods that were made there. There was the textiles, primarily purple cloth and then metalworking. The people that worked in these industries would form themselves into trade guilds in order to make a living. And in order to be successful in your business, in order to succeed at what you were doing in your trade, you had to be a member of these guilds. Now, you probably have not heard of Thyatira until today. But you may have heard of a woman by the name of Lydia. We encounter her in Acts 16 verse 4 when Paul and his mission team find themselves in Philippi and it says that they encounter a lady named Lydia who was from this city and she was a seller of purple goods. She was probably at one time in one of these trade guilds. So let us turn to scripture now and we're going to start reading at Revelation 2 verse 18. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like the flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. I know all the things you do. I've seen your love, your faith, your service and your patient endurance. And I can see that your constant improvement in all these things. But I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. I give, gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. The general structure in these letters is the giving of an affirmation and then the giving of of a warning. To Thyatira, the affirmation is this, you are crushing it in your mission. You're loving people, you're compassionate, you're engaged in social justice and bringing right to the world, you're assisting the poor and oppressed and you're caring for the sick. You're bringing reconciliation and transforming lives and communities and stories. You're on mission every day and you're doing it better and better and better. And the warning is this, you're tolerating sin. The church had the opposite problem of the church in Ephesus. If you recall from a few weeks ago, the church in Ephesus was very diligent about doing right doctrine and rooting out false teaching and making sure they were embracing the proper truths of the message of Jesus and putting it in place, putting that moral code there. And to that church, Jesus says, you've got your doctrine right, but you've forgotten to love each other. So do the things you did first. This church has the opposite problem. Jesus is saying you're doing great at loving one another. You're on it. But you're missing a couple of things in your doctrine. And how that plays out is you're tolerating sin. And there were two that were mentioned especially, idolatry and sexual immorality. And it's here that Jezebel is mentioned as leading them astray. Now we don't know if that was an actual person or people or not. I think probably not, but it may be a reference back to Jezebel that we meet in the first and second Kings who was the wife of King Ahab. Now Jezebel in the Old Testament was very bad news. And you know who the bad characters are in the Bible because we don't name our children after them. Herod, Delilah, Goliath. There's not a lot of them running around and there's certainly not a lot of little Jezebels running around today. And what we know about Jezebel is that she was the one that primarily introduced the worship of Baal into Israel. And it was the beginning of the end for the northern tribes of Israel. And so this is possibly a code name that's used to describe this person or persons who is saying to the church there, hey, you can dabble a little bit in idolatry. You can dip your toe into sexual immorality. It's okay. Actually, 
I'm not sure what dipping your toe into sexual immorality will look like, but hey, let's move on quickly. To be a member of one of these trade guilds meant that you were expected to participate together in the pagan worship of the day. And that would mean sitting at the table eating the meat that had been sacrificed to idols. It meant going into their temples. And often sexual practices and acts were part of that worship. This may sound strange to us. But this was just normal everyday life then. It was expected that they would do these things together. And so to walk away from that was to commit career suicide. You see, if you refused to take part in the practice of the trade guild, no business was going to come your way. And so your livelihood was on the line if you took a stand and refused to join in. And there were people in this church who were saying, you know what, it's okay to continue in some of these things. You're loving God, you're loving people, you're expressing compassion, you're involved in mission. It's okay to do these other things on the side. They were loving and compassionate people. They were being the hands and feet of Jesus. They were making a difference in the world, but tolerated just a couple of things. Just kind of glossed over them. Just kind of shoved them under the rug. Just kind of shrugged them off. Just kind of thought, well, I don't want to get too caught up in legalism. I want to focus on what I'm doing right. I wonder, what are you tolerating? I mean, what's that little thing that you just ignore or hide away? Everything else in your life is okay. And that one little thing, well, because of the greater good, Jesus just isn't as concerned about that because... It hasn't really hurt me or hurt anyone else or hurt my witness. It must be okay. I'm just going to kind of gloss over that one. But here's the deal. I truly believe for many of us, we're not even sure what that thing is that we are tolerating. But here's what's dangerous. Even though it may be difficult to locate or admit, what we tolerate in our lives will replicate and to it suffocates our life in Christ. Let me say that again. What we tolerate in our lives will replicate and to it suffocates our life in Christ. I wonder, what are you tolerating? Jesus says, repent. And to the church in Thyatira, who were tolerating, Jesus said, repent. Now, for those of us, again, that are in church circles, this word sounds harsh. And a lot of times we interpret it to mean get your act together, clean up your mess, pull it together. But it really doesn't mean that. It simply means to turn around, to change your mind. In Romans 8, 1, we're told that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that anyone who is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And in Romans 2.4 we learn that God's kindness leads us to repentance. In light of your identity in Christ, in light of your freedom in Christ, in light of God's kindness, what are you tolerating? Jesus says there's a better way. And I think the message to the church then puts a few questions before us today. The first one is, will we be faithful at the crossroads? As we stand today at the crossroads of all sorts of culture and ideas and politics and society and life, will we be faithful and obedient at the crossroads where we've been put? And I think another question that faces us is, is the way and the message of Jesus compelling enough to make us love one another well? And does our commitment to Jesus mean more than other preferences, opinions, affiliations, loyalties that we have? And are we tolerating something that risks our joy and our peace and our life in Christ? What are we tolerating? At the end of the letter to the church, Jesus proclaims that the one who is victorious, he will give the morning star 
And again, I think this language is very intentional. If you remember in the city stood the temple to the sun god Apollo, and in stark contrast to that, the writer is saying, Jesus is the true light. He is the light who guides. He is the light who illuminates. He is the light who heals. He is the light who has the power to change the circumstances of the world that we live in. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he turns around and he also says to each one of us, you are the light of the world. Is there something that we're tolerating that is diminishing the light of, of Christ in us? I wonder... Would you stand with me now, wherever you're watching this today, as I pray for you. I pray that the Spirit go before you to guide you, behind you to propel you, above you to overshadow you and protect you, below you to undergird you and support you, and beside you to comfort you, and to strengthen you and to give you peace. Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear what you are speaking to your church today. In Jesus' name, Amen. In my search for the Holy Spirit and, um, and in my search to hear his voice clearly, I have been singing the, the next song, I think, daily. And, and I guess in a way it's a bit personal, but I decided to bring it today because it's also what I feel God is calling us as a church, as I said at the beginning of the set. Um, so I invite you to, to sing this song along with me or maybe just listen to it quietly if you, if you don't know it. But just to soak in the words to, you know, maybe to take it as a prayer coming from your heart to our Heavenly Father.
everyone it's time again for this week's family challenge so adam has been talking about some of the things that might extinguish the flame that god is trying to fan within our life and that and that flame representing sort of that passion that intimacy that connection um with god so it might be things like circumstances such as you know if someone's been hurt or stealing or um, bullying, or just busyness. You get distracted by the business of everyday life that we f forget to take that time and connect in with God. So what are the things that you find that distinguish, or extinguish, sorry, uh, that flame within, within you and your family? And you could, I've sent around this PDF, um, you could write them inside, you can colour it in, you can draw in. Um, what are the things that are fire extinguishers inside here 
and around the outside, you could either write or draw the things that actually really help to connect you and your family with with God. I think it's actually really important to to share that as a family and to share that with one another or a friend um, or somebody that you feel connected to. Um, and then just take the time, maybe um, put on the song Set a Fire Down in My Soul if you put it on YouTube um, and just pray for one another um, that that flame in you as individuals um, and together would really begin to um, begin to spark. And maybe um, if I can suggest actually just saying that in that time um, that you're not going to get, make a rule that you're not going to get told off um, for what you say. So whatever you say in this space and in, in this time is okay. Because um, I think we really need some some honesty in those discussions. So I really, really hope and I pray um, over everybody that would begin to help identify what are the things that extinguish the flame in our lives. And how can we help one another, whether that's friends or the family or people close to us, to help ignite that passion and protect it uh, and safeguard it for one another. So have a lovely week. You take care. Bye. Thank you, Andrea, for that challenge. And as we come to a close, uh, if any of you have been impacted by the content today and just want to learn and understand more about what it does mean to follow Jesus, you can click on any of the links that appear in the comments thread um, or you can go to the Broadmead website, broadmead.org.uk and if you click on the I'm New section, you'll be able to find out more and we'd love to have that conversation with you too. So Adam's just going to now close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for our time together this morning. Lord, we're in a time when everything is being stirred up, where there is an uncovering, where we're in a season we've never been in before. And so, Lord God, we need your peace. We need your comfort. We need your mercies that are new every morning. We want to express your compassion to one another. So Lord God, I pray that you would bless each and every person watching now. That they would know that you are for them. And that you are with them. And that with you, they are more than conquerors. So Lord God, as we enter into this new week, may we trust you for our, all our tomorrows. Mm. Because you're already in them, going ahead of us and strengthening us. Amen. Amen.